Well, I've got a spare chair and a spare microphone. If anybody would like to come join me. <laughs> Justin is not going to be here tonight. So what do you want to talk about? Uh, he, he texted me uh, this afternoon and is not well, so he's, he's staying home. Hope you feel better, Justin, if you're watching. Um, so I don't have anybody to start off by asking how they're doing or anything. Um, how are you doing? What's that? How are you doing? I'm doing okay, thanks. The, uh, we're back into the swing of things. This last week felt weird because it was our first full week back to school, and, and uh, it was a weird week. But this week feels like school. School is normal now that we were there a whole week. So uh, today, today was a good day. Um, so we are in the book of John, making our way in uh, small increments. It seems like towards the conclusion, but um, but it's okay. It's been a great study. I think uh, I've really enjoyed it, and enjoy that we can. Um, really take our time through these uh, this section of these chapters and talk in depth about um, the things that are revealed to us about Jesus, um, about the crucifixion, about the trial, and the things that we've been on for the last several weeks. Uh, it's just been very good. So uh, last week we started John 20, uh, and we went through the first... Um, we did We did read the first 10 verses and talk about them, but seems like there was maybe one thing uh, left unresolved that we needed to talk about. And so we'll read through those first 10 verses again. And if you guys remember what that thing that was un unresolved, we'll talk about it. If you don't, I might just skip it because I remember what it was. But um, we'll, see. we'll see if you guys are, uh, if your memories are good. So um, in John 19, of course, we had the crucifixion of Jesus and now... Um, at the end of John 19, had uh, Joseph of Arimathea and, and Nicodemus take the body of Jesus and uh, place it in a, in a tomb near the garden that was not far from the place where he was crucified. Um, and we talked all through that. So we're ready, <clears throat> we're ready now for, uh, for what comes next. So, and we did read this last week, but uh, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene uh, came early to the tomb while it was dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together. The other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came to him uh, following him and entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head not lying with the linen wrappings but rolled up in a place by itself so the other disciple who had come first to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead so the disciples went away again to their own homes um, so we talked talked through most of this last week, I think, but they, uh, you know, walking uh, walking the streetlights in the in the early uh, in the early brights. I don't remember what the early brights was, but the the you know going there while it was still dark. And you think about what what that would mean for us with the, the streetlight shining and everything. And so um, you know, how did they navigate their way there? But remember, it was a short distance. The, it was not. It's not like they had to take a trek through the through the countryside. There was uh, this was not far. Uh, from the place where Jesus was crucified, which was not far um, from the um, from the temple complex and from the um, from the uh, um, house of the high priest or the, the courtyard where the trial had taken place um, and, and where where Pilate's um, official abode was and all those things. This was not far away, um, and so the you know the response that that Mary and, and Peter and, and John have, um, you know, about where did he go? Mary's, Mary's initial reaction is, where is he? We, you know, they've taken the body of Jesus away. We don't know where they've laid him. 
And so in her mind, Jesus is, is still dead, uh, as you would expect if you're going to a tomb to visit the, the recently deceased. Uh, you would expect to find that, that body there, and when it's not there, your assumption would be that it's somewhere, but it's still a body that you're seeking. And so that's Mary's, um, kind of Mary's take on the situation. And we talked last week about, uh, you know, the, consider the faith of the Jewish leaders who had remembered that Jesus said uh, he would be raised after three days. And what did they do? In the other gospel accounts, we know that they had uh, requested that they post a guard, you know, put, put soldiers there, guard the tomb, seal it, so that we know that his disciples don't steal the body because they, he's been claiming he's going to be raised. And so we expect something to happen in the next three days, uh, but we don't know what it'll be. And so, um, and so they were expecting something to happen, but here Jesus' disciples come to the tomb expecting nothing has happened. Um, they expect that Jesus is still there. And so it's an interesting, interesting kind of juxtaposition or contrast about the, um, the differing responses of those who are involved in this story. Um, so, uh, did, by the way, did anybody remember what answer we, or what question we left unresolved last week? Because I'm willing to skip it. John, you remember? You would, would Johnny. I, I have my own here. Oh, okay, you have one. All right. Why does verse 8 says, and they remember, and then verse 9 said, they didn't understand that he was risen? Why didn't they remember? Okay. So, and that, that I think is the, the unresolved, there's the unresolved question. What, what is it that John believed? So the other disciple who had come first to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. Okay, so what is it that he, did he just believe? Oh, I, yeah, Mary's right. The body's gone. Is that what he believed? Um, or is, it, is there something grander than that, something, something much larger that is, that is hinted at or declared by, by the statement that John believed? He was resurrected. I, I go with that too because okay. um, it, there, there was a change that came about because it says that they still did not understand from Scripture Jesus had to raise from, rise from the dead. So yeah. it was a surprise. He came in yeah. and he saw what had happened, and okay, yeah, he's, he's raised. You know, they, it, it, to that point, they didn't understand that he was supposed to be raised. <clears throat> I, I, and I, I think you're right. Um, can you turn me down just a little bit? I feel like I'm really loud and I'm, I'm trying not to be too loud. Um, so I, I think you're exactly right. And we can talk about some, some indications in the text uh, that are, that are um, signs, I guess, for us or, or indications for us uh, of what it is that John believed. First of all, what is perhaps the most important word in all of the book of John? I mean, isn't, isn't the whole purpose of the book of John for belief, and, and we're jumping ahead, but look at the, the last two verses of this chapter, if you have your Bibles open, verses uh, 30 and 31, you know, these things have been written so that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So it would be weird if John enters the empty tomb of Jesus, and the declaration of John in his own writing is that this disciple whom Jesus loved believed but I'm not talking about the belief I've been writing about all through the gospel. I'm talking about something else. This was a little belief. And, and uh, I'm not talking about the belief that I'm trying to get you to have. And so I think that, for me, that's the primary indication through, through the, because it, it keeps the context of the whole story in check. Uh, and, it, and it just flows with everything else that we've had up to this point, that we want to establish belief in the reader. And if this one time we're going to say, not that belief, you know, back off. We're not ready for that yet. That's weird. That's not the way this story unfolds. And so for me, that's the, that's the big one. Don. I was just going to make a point. I don't know if this point was made last week because I couldn't hear very good up there. <laughs> but but uh, Peter, I think, is still being considered as a leader at this point. Mary uh -huh. goes to him and goes, to, and, and obviously it must be John that's following with him and beats him to the tomb, obviously, right? But he doesn't yeah. go in and then Peter goes down inside. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Obviously, uh, there must be some uh, speculation, maybe still yet, uh, among them that this is going to happen. 
Okay. Is what I'm I kind of gathering that just yeah. out of watching it develop as it goes. Yeah. But I don't know. I think I think you're right, and, it, and it's interesting you bring up kind of the, the primacy of Peter there, and and a lot of things. I some of the reading I did this afternoon. Um, Kind of, kind of hinted at some of those same things. And when you look at, at what Peter is the first to do, you know, he's the first to enter the tomb. He's the first to, um, he's the first one in other gospel accounts. He's the first one, the first of the apostles that Jesus shows himself to. Um, he's the first one to preach the gospel sermon. He's the first to bring the Gentiles um, into the church. You know, the, I mean, there's there's all kinds of things that Peter is first at. And so um, this is, a, you know, this fits right in that story. Rich, verse nine. For as yet, okay, tells me right. that prior to stepping in and seeing his body gone, he they did not understand. Up until it. this moment, up to that moment, yeah, it hit him. And I think you're right, for I, I think um, you know we put um, because we know because we know the story start to finish. I think sometimes in our own minds we we chronologicalize. <laughs> I don't know if that's a word, but I just said it. Uh, we, we put things in a chronology that, that, that fits, and, and, I, and I think maybe we'll see some of that here in a minute too, but, um, you know, we, we hang a lot of, of emphasis on what's going to happen on Pentecost and that full understanding that comes to the disciples with the, the, um, with the Holy Spirit falling upon them at, at Pentecost and saying, well, yeah, John doesn't understand yet because the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. And so he can't, he can't have a full understanding or a proper understanding of what it means in this moment. So even if it is believe, it's not full belief. It's not real belief. It's not, it's not um, fully mature belief yet because he has, doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have the benefit of that relationship yet. And so, I, but, I, but I think we need to maybe back off of that and say for, for what has taken place, for the evidence that John has in this moment, John has the belief that is warranted at this moment. Um, and he, you know, it's, it's maybe, maybe it's not as full as it will be when the Holy Spirit descends on Pentecost. Maybe it's, you know, maybe his understanding is going to increase as he spends more time with Jesus over the next seven weeks and then Pentecost happens. But for this moment, that belief is full. That belief is, is pure. That belief is, is, is what he is able or, or uh, uh, enabled to have in that moment. Okay, I thought your hand was up, Johnny. You not jumping in? You sure? Okay, all right. Um, ah, Tim, there you go. Soul. <laughs> well, the lyric calls it a face cloth. Some translations call it a handkerchief. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there's something very significant in that because if someone was to go in and steal that one, they yeah. wouldn't give a rat's patooey whether that linen fell on the yeah. ground or was folded or anything like that. Yeah. Someone took the time to fold it and put it down and put it away. That had to be a conscious living person. If they're, if they're taking a body, you'd want to treat it like a body. And if it's wrapped in linen wrappings and it's and it's you know contained within those things, you're going to take those things with you if you're still in a body. Um, and so inter interesting again, yeah, some of the, the the reading that I did this afternoon actually made made quite an argument based on what they saw when they entered the tomb. And, and these are not, I mean, this is not a, it's not a burial garment like we would think of a burial garment. I mean, when we have a loved one that departs, you know, we, we pick out the outfit for them that we want them to wear. And, and I think what we picture is walking into the tomb and seeing, you know, uh, dad's favorite shirt or whatever folded up on the, folded up on the, the end of the bench. And it's, that's not what it is. The idea of it being rolled up is this was what was rolled around Jesus' head, and and it's still rolled in that manner. He that when he ra it wasn't that Jesus sat up from the tomb and unrolled this thing and then folded it up. He rose through it. He he just he was no longer in that that wrapping, and that wrapping was there rolled as though it was still rolled around somebody who had been departed, and so. You can't recreate that. I mean, you can't, you can't make that rolling around nothing. And so when you look at it, and it's obvious that was rolled around his, his face, his head, and now his face and his head are not there, but it's still rolled like it was. Um, it's kind of the, the way. And, I, and that was an interesting take. I'm not sure 
I'm not going to hang my hat on that or, or say this is the way you have to picture it or, or the way that it had to have been done. But this, you know, the, the, the author made an interesting case for it. And that being kind of a, an indicator to Peter and John that, um, that Jesus was not just taken away and these things folded up there, but that he had been, that, but that he had extricated himself from those wrappings in a way that was miraculous. And so it, it, it created an interesting mental picture for me. And with all the speculating about some of the things that we've done in, in this, throughout this whole series of lessons, I thought that was an interesting thing just to give you a mental image of. Uh, Tim. When we go back to Lazarus, mm -hmm. what did he say? Unbind him. Yeah, unbind Lazarus when Lazarus came out. He could not physically have done it if you yeah. were, were somehow yeah. practicing. And that's a good point. They had seen, and these disciples had seen Lazarus race, and they knew what it was for Lazarus to come out of the tomb um, and, and still be bound. And so they would have seen those wrappings and those bindings uh, in that occasion and had to have removed them. But in this case, they, they were removed. Um, they, they weren't removed. The, the wrappings weren't removed from Jesus. Jesus was removed from the wrappings. And, and that's different. You know, that's a different indication. Um, and, and he also, you know, some other, other interesting things to think about. You know, why did the angel, and, and um, we'll talk more about the angels in a minute, but why, why did the angel open the tomb so that Jesus could get out? Does Jesus, what is Jesus going to do here in a few minutes in the upper room where the disciples are gathered? The doors are shut and Jesus is there. Does Jesus need the tomb to be open so that he can get out? The tomb needs to be open so Peter and John can get in, and, and Mary and the others. So um, the tomb needs, you know, the angels open the tomb so that people could see in that it was empty, not so that Jesus could get out. And I thought that was a really, a really good point to make. Um, that's not mine. That's from, from the writing, uh, from the, the article I was reading this afternoon. But um, so, so I appreciate that. Um, so uh, kind of interesting, we had already talked about this section last week, but uh, we're still talking about it this week. That's good. Um, John was humble enough to remain nameless, but bold enough to claim victory. And, and I thought that, you know, that's kind of a good picture of John throughout the, the New Testament. Um, the, and imagine that, what, what do you do after you look in the tomb and you see those wrappings and you believe Big capital B, believe, and then you go home. Um, if Jesus, if they thought Jesus had been stolen, what would they naturally want to do? Try to find him. I mean, they're, they, they want to know where he is. They want to know where he's been taken. They want to know where the body's been laid so that they can minister to it, so that they can, so that they can have a, a recording and a marking of, of where that's at. But we see that the tomb is empty and we believe we don't have to go find Jesus because what's going to happen? Jesus is going to come find us. And, and so they leave not as a, as a matter of defeat, but as a, a statement of victory. It's a statement of, a statement of faith that it's time to now you know, wait for the Lord to tell us what, what happens next, what we do next. Um, and so I thought I like, I like that picture of them returning uh, to wait on Jesus. Johnny. The other thing to think about here is, you know, we have seen them with Jesus for the last three years or so, and you don't hardly ever think of them of a, having a home. You know, they're right. kind of homeless wandering around all the time. Right. But they had homes. Yeah. But they were from Galilee. Most of them, weren't they? So it's interesting. I mean, with the home where they were staying, or the place where they were staying, maybe, um, because I think you know Peter was was from Capernaum, wasn't he? and uh, others of them were. So Peter and Andrew would have been from there. James and John were from that same area. Um, so Peter and John returning home was not returning to Capernaum. It was going back to where they were in Jerusalem, which was not their home, um, and so or their home at least in the way we'd think of it. But they they. Uh, um, but they went back to the place where they were lodging, maybe is the way that we would. Uh, but it does say they went back again to their own homes. Well, I don't know. I've never thought about that before. That's an interesting question. Um, we'll let Justin answer that one next week. Justin, that's your homework if you're listening. All right. Um, verses 11 to 18. So Peter and John have left. 
to return to their own homes, it says. Uh, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because we have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to, my fa- to, to the Father, but go to my brethren, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Uh, I confess to using Justin's notes. He already had these prepared. So uh, we're, you know, these are, I thought this was a, an interesting breakdown of that section, the way that he had worded these things. So that's, uh, I, I just left it there. Um, out of all the, the biblical encounters with angels, um, Mary's kind of, stand, kind of stands out as being weird. Um, you know, when, when Daniel saw the angel Gabriel, his knees knocked together. And he was terrified. And, and uh, when Mary, you know, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and, and told her that she was going to be a child, you know, she had a, a visible reaction to being approached by, by an angel. You know, we could go on and on through the list of people that were visited by angels. Um, I suppose uh, the, the passage comes to mind of those who were, had entertained angels unawares that, that we read in Hebrews. Um, and so perhaps, you know, sometimes the appearance of an angel is marked by some kind of um, phenomenon or some kind of visual stimulus that lets the person know, I'm an angel. And then other times, perhaps that, that visual stimulus or whatever it is is gone, is, is not there, depending on God's purpose in sending that angel or, or the purpose of their message or whatever. And so maybe it is that they were angels and Mary just didn't recognize them as angels. If that's the case, and later mm-hmm. on they discuss it amongst themselves uh-huh. and realize that's all they could have done. Yeah. Nothing else could have got in there. Yeah. Physically have gotten in there. Well, and that's, you know, who had just left? She saw Peter and John come out of the tomb, and did Peter and John see anybody in the tomb? I don't think so. I mean, they were, they, they, you know, it's not there. It would have been mentioned. They, we know what they saw. They saw the wrappings. Uh, that had been around Jesus and they were still laying there. And then they left to go home and Mary, still there weeping, peers into the tomb for the first time and she sees now two men sitting there. I find it interesting that the angels weren't there for Peter and John. Yeah. And Jesus wasn't either. Yeah. But then when Mary comes, she's the one that gets to take the message back. Right. There was a, yeah, there was a definite um, uh, motive or, or um, purpose behind Jesus appearing in the order and in the manner in which he appeared uh, to various people or various groups of people. Um, there are at least four, four or five encounters that Jesus has um, uh, through, through this and then other gospel renderings of, of that very first day. So he, he appears to Mary here, first of all. Um, in the other Gospels, he appears to a group of women, and Mary included in that group of women. He also appears to, on the road to Emmaus uh, with, the, with the two travelers. Um, he appears to Peter, singularly. And then later here in this chapter, he's going to appear to all of the disciples after dark in the, upper, in the, in the room where they are gathered, which we assume is that same upper, upper room where they had the, the Last Supper. Um, and so... You know, there's at least five different appearances, but this is the first one. This is the the first encounter that Jesus has with a with another person uh, after his resurrection. Those angels might have been his company. Yeah. Because immediately she turned around and Jesus was there. Yeah. So it, it, they, you know, it just might have been. They yeah. might have been ministering to him. That that you know that's an interesting thought and, and think about. You know the position that Jesus was in before his crucifixion, when when he um, when at what point did he tell his disciples? Do you, do you think that my I couldn't ask my father would send uh, you know a legion of angels, ten legions of angels, or whatever it was? He said, I can't remember that quote, but 
Uh, and, and so Jesus never, never asked for that, but now his mission is complete, and now he has that, um, now he has that escort. He has that, the, those angels to minister to his needs in a way that he... I don't, I don't know what the right word is. He, he, he foregoed those. <laughs> he, he, uh, he withdrew his right to those things. He, it's not that he couldn't ask for them, but he didn't. And it's not that the Father couldn't send those to him, but he didn't, chose not to. And so, um, so now it's appropriate and it's right for Jesus to have an angel escort. It's appropriate for him to have an angel, ministering angels with him, um, lest he dash his foot against a stone, um, to coin a phrase. So, um, so that's, a, that's an interesting thought that they may have been his, you know, his ministering angels. Um, and so that, you know, that conversation that Mary has with, uh, um, with the angels, you know, it's, it kind of bleeds into that a most, it's, it's a strange angel encounter as far as other angel encounters that we read about, but we don't, we don't know. I mean, it, there could be a reason for it. It could be that Mary was just so distraught that she didn't, didn't notice. She had, you know, she couldn't see the, the glow of the angels due to the, the cloudiness of the tears in her eyes. And, and that's, that's fine if that's what it was. I have no problem with that. Uh, or it could just be that these angels were in disguise and they didn't look like angels. Um, what about the fact that Jesus speaks to her and she doesn't know who he is? Does that seem strange? I, she's, she's very distraught. She, she is distraught. She, she has to be. She's not a little bit distraught. She's a lot distraught. She be she's, I think... In, in common vernacular in today's language, I think she, we would say she's ugly crying, right? I mean, she's not, she's not feeling depressed or bummed out or a little bit sad. She's, she is weeping, and she is, um, you know, she is beside herself. She is, she is completely, um, completely not, not in her right mind at this moment. Um, and so I think there's, there's indications of that just from from what the text says, first of all, but also the way she reacts to these things. That she, first of all, it's not weird to her that there's a couple of guys sitting in the tomb and, and she has a conversation with them. And then when it's Jesus and she turns to him, she thinks he's the one that took the body. Well, what about the two guys that are in the tomb? You don't think that they took the body? So it's, you know, it's the gardener that she thinks has, has the answers. And so she's, she's, I don't think fully aware of what she's saying or doing maybe in this moment. Well, in the essence also with the road to Emmaus, uh, you know, the two men had no clue who Jesus They didn't was know, the so, yeah. And so there may be a withholding of that information from her as well, the way that Jesus somehow blinded the eyes of the, of the men on the road to Emmaus, and it wasn't until he sat down and ate with them, and, and in that moment said something, I can't remember what, he says something that triggers it, and all of a sudden they know who he is and he disappears. Um, got a footnote saying a number of times the risen Jesus was not recognized. Yeah. He may have looked different or he may have intentionally prevented recognition. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think I'm okay with however that happened. I, it, it's not a problem for my belief or faith that, that somebody who spent as much time with Jesus as Mary did, didn't recognize him in that moment uh, until Jesus was ready for her to recognize him. Go ahead, Johnny. But how many times have you gone to some place and there's somebody there that's not in a place you have ever seen them and you don't recognize them and they say hey and they go what are you doing here it's Every, like yeah. you didn't recognize them because they're not in a place that you expected to see them she didn't expect yeah. to see Jesus standing there yeah. every time I go to Walmart I see somebody that I, I know I should know that person but they're not at the place I usually see them and so yeah um, so you're exactly right yeah Yep. If you were to witness someone executed in that manner, Rudely, yeah. there'd be no thought in your mind that that person could ever be alive. Yeah. And if, if we do find Jesus alive somewhere, he's not he's not up walking around. He's he's laid low by the, the injuries and, and things. If he didn't die, uh, and then be miraculously raised. So, so I think you're right, Rich. This may sound strange. I've always had a feeling that. At that point in time, because he could basically go wherever he wanted to go and even disappear, that he wasn't fully visible. The, you know, there, there have been, I've, I've read things about different, 
um, kind of theories or, or indications of, of the of how Jesus manifested himself in, in his post-resurrection appearances. Um, we do know that he was fully physical because he eats uh, on a couple of occasions. He does ingest food, which you wouldn't be able to do. He does ask his disciples to handle him here even later in this chapter. You know, touch the wounds, put your hand in my side. Um, and so so from a from a physical standpoint, he is... He is fully physical, but I got to think he's still changed. He's, I mean, there's something different about his demeanor, about, about there's something different. And, yeah. and I mean, so, yeah. It, it, there's that strange thing about him saying, don't hold on to me, for I've yeah. not yet returned to my father. I, yeah. I, I don't quite get that, but, but that does speak to him being somewhat different. And, and that, I, yeah, I, I spent some time, I was hoping that the guy I was reading from would, would kind of go into that a little bit more than he did. Um, the, the idea for, for me, it was almost a, um, it, it runs the gamut from, from almost on one end of the spectrum being kind of a cultural thing where Jewish men and were not, you don't, you know, a, a, the, it's a distinction between male and female. The females don't cling to a man that's not their or their close relative, their, their brother or their husband or their father or something like that. And so from the appearance of, of Jesus being a physical man alone in a, in a garden with a woman and she's clinging to him, that, I mean, just in a physical sense, the appearance of that may not be appropriate. All the way to the other end of the spectrum of there being something, you know, about Jesus being, his, his state or his form being altered to the point where he is, you know, he's, He's more closely aligned to his form of holiness or his form of, of perfection, um, where it would be inappropriate for it to be to be touched by human hands or something like that. But then he, he's going to turn right around and invite his disciples to, to touch him and handle him. So so it's not just the, the idea of a physical touch that is not appropriate. There's something about this moment in this setting that Jesus wants her to stop. Is it possible yeah. that that stop clinging to me is more of an emotional clinging because of her emotional state at that point? Yeah. It could be. And stop, stop clinging to me to the, in the sense, remember the whole conversation he's had with his disciples in the upper room before his betrayal that, you know, you guys, I've told you I'm leaving and you guys haven't asked the right questions. You, you're trying to figure out how to prevent that and you need to let me go because it's to your advantage that you let me go. And so... This whole ordeal that Jesus has just witnessed that Mary is weeping uncontrollably to the point that she doesn't recognize two angels in his tomb to where she's turned and spoken to him and she doesn't recognize his voice. Um, and now, you know, Mary, this, this has gotten out of hand. Your, your grief is beyond what it should be because you don't recognize the purpose of why I've been here. I think you, you hit on it there. When, when he told the, the disciples, you want me to go yeah. because the Holy Spirit can't come unless I go. Right. She was maybe clinging to him to, to keep him yeah. from going. And, and he, he was trying to tell her, I'm going to go to my father. Yeah. And so don't, don't try and, to And from, again, from Mary's standpoint, what she went to the tomb to visit the body of Jesus and Jesus was gone. And now she's found him. She doesn't want to let him go. I'm not losing you again. You know, I'm not letting you out of my sight. Because if, the last time I let you out of my sight, you disappeared on me. Yeah. And so, I, so Jesus could be setting her straight there and saying, you know, this, this, this is going to happen. i got to go. Yeah, go. I'm, go. I'm leaving. And you, and you have something to do. I need you to go and tell the disciples what's going on. So, yeah. um, so it is a, just a, an interesting encounter. And John records this encounter. You know, the other, the other Gospels don't record this encounter. And so this is where we learn this information. And so, and, and of course, critics of the Bible will say, well, look here, there's a discrepancy because the other, the other Gospels record that he saw a group of women. And here it says John saw, and John, he just saw Mary by herself. And so there's a contradiction there in the Bible about what happens. Well, no, I mean, there are, there are multiple visits to the tomb that day. And Mary's going to go and tell the disciples, well, who's she going to tell next? She's going to go tell all of her best friends. And then they're going to go to the tomb together. And they're going to have another encounter with Jesus. Uh, and so, 
so it's not odd or awkward to, to reconcile those things and, and to be able to say this is, this is the first encounter of several that are going to take place. So we know on the cross, Jesus' spirit left. Where's it been for three days? Uh, not here. <laughs> uh, it's been where the dead go. And so I think, um, you know, <laughs> what is your, what is the, uh, um, well, I won't think of the verse now. Um, We're told he's Jesus preached to the lost. Preached to the, uh, preached to the lost during these three days. I don't know that he was preaching to the lost. I think maybe he was preaching to the saved during these three days. Um, um, it's not where I thought it was. Does it say, somewhere it says that he went and preached to those who, to those in, I think King James says in hell. Uh, but remember King James is weird, even if we're not willing to admit it. Uh, and that word means those who have gone on and, and there is a spirit, spirit realm. We talked about that in our, um, in our study book a year ago about the, you know, about, about the afterlife, that there is a division of the afterlife. And so I think my, my, um, Johnny, why'd you go here? All right. My, uh, thought on that is that Jesus probably was in what we would call paradise, um, the realm of the dead who are, are, have gone on to await judgment, who are righteous, and they're not in heaven yet because Jesus has not yet ascended to his Father. I mean, he says that right here. I haven't ascended to my Father, so he hasn't gone to heaven. But where do the souls or the spirits of the dead go um, bef while, while they're awaiting judgment to see whether or not they go to the Father or they don't go to the Father? Um, yeah. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise, and that is, and that is where, you know, Abraham's bosom, the the rich man and Lazarus, he was in paradise, and Abraham's bosom, and, and there was a gulf fixed between there and, and Hades, or there and, and uh, torment. Um, and so, uh, so I would suggest that Jesus was there, and he saw. And there he saw John the Baptist, and there he saw the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the prophets, and there he saw David, and there he saw those that had gone on before, those that have been telling this story for generations and centuries that have been preparing the world for this moment, and, and Jesus ministered to them there. He, he let them know. 1 Peter 3.19. How much? 1 Peter 3.19. Well, that's where I was. It's close to where I was. I didn't, I didn't, that's right where I was, uh, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Let's uh, see, Christ, uh, go back to verse, Christ also died for the sins once for all just for the unjust in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, um, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. Well, that didn't clear anything up. Um, so where is um, Proclamation to the spirits now in prison. And that word now I have underlined and a note next to it says that's commentary. That's not really in the text. The word now is not in the text. Um, did you <coughs> did I hear you right? It was he was in spirit when he did this. Put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went. He went in, in the, spirit. the spirit, made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, to the spirits now in prison. So where is this prison that he went to? Well, um, 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 I might have an answer for that. Um, 
that's not going to say what I think it says. Um, the death, let's see, that's not what it, death is not prison, death, oh, de death is swallowed in victory, or death where's your victory, or death where's your sting. I think, I think death is prison. Yeah, I think you're right. um, and so he went to those that were dead and preached to them because they are bound up there and not able to come back. Uh, but I think he went there to proclaim to them the victory that was being attained through, for, uh, through the, the ministry which he had performed. Um, and plus, because it was not time for him to ascend back to the Father, because once he ascends back to the Father, what is the Father going to do? He's going to seat him upon the throne. And so if Jesus goes back to the Father now, it's not time to be seated upon the throne. Um, and so, because he hasn't been raised yet. And so the resurrection hasn't taken place. It's not time for him to send back to the Father. Uh, do we have a problem with what it's referring to? It says he was put to death in the body, but was made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Is, is it Jesus who's preaching, or is it the Spirit? Because it's talking about the days of Noah. And... Um, so I've, I've got a, a note here where at least one person thinks that that through whom, it's talking about the Spirit, also went and preached to the spirits of prison who disobeyed long ago. So it, it, there were, they were trying to, in the days of Noah, they were trying to get people mm -hmm. to, to change and repent. And, yeah. and the Spirit was working through Noah um, to, to bring about that repentance, which didn't happen. Um, and so ultimately, a few people, eight and all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes. So it goes on to talk about baptism as a great scripture, of course, that, that talks about uh, baptism, which now saves you. Um, and so it, 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 the passage may be more about the Spirit um, than about Jesus preaching. And, it, and that all hinges on how you, how you read that word Spirit, because, for instance, in, in my... Bible, the, the word spirit at the end of verse 18 is lowercase, indicating that these translators believe it's not the Holy Spirit, but and then there's a footnote that has or spirit with a capital S because they think they might be wrong, but they're not sure. Yeah. And so if yours has the big letter S spirit, if they think yeah. it's the Holy Spirit, but yeah. they might be wrong, maybe it's a little lowercase S. Yeah. So, that, so that that whole interpretation, I mean the, the whole interpretation of the passage is changes based on whether you think that's a capital S or a lowercase S in that one word, which is an interesting, you know, an interesting thing to, to um, have to speculate. Yeah, mine has a capital S with a footnote that is a capital S. See, mine's <laughs> totally opposite. So, um, so that's, I mean, fascinating. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure it resolves anything for us. No. Um, we, we would have to, we'd have to really start parsing some more. That's where we need our, uh, and, and the word is the same either way. It's, I mean, the word is new mind, Greek. And it's, it's the same whether you're using it for the Holy Spirit or whether you're just using the word spirit. Well, and it so, has to be the Holy Spirit. What, what other spirit would make you alive? But he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the spirit. Well, made alive in, in his spirit, in, in the spirit. He was made alive in, in the spirit. Um, he was put to death in the flesh, but his spirit was alive. So it's not, it's not the Holy Spirit of God, but his own spirit that was made alive. Um, and so, and, and it was in his spirit that he went and made proclamation to those spirits, is, lowercase s. Is now Jesus a spirit different than the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus had it was is, embodied is, by his own spirit. It, it is his Holy yeah. Spirit. But they're still separate entities. Yeah, they but are, they're one. They're <laughs> different, separate, but one. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah. And so, yes. I think we should study the spirit this year. <laughs> Man, I'm going to preach myself into a bunch of quarters this year. I can feel it. But you said, <laughs> uh, "This, yeah, yeah I think stuff. I think we should study the Spirit next year and give me a year to study <laughs> the Spirit before I start preaching on it." That would have been a great idea. Oh, that been nice. That would have been great. Okay, Rich. We've already covered John chapter five, but uh, verse twenty-five. Is that, have, is that getting in the ballpark? John 5.25 um, True the truth I say to you an hour is coming and now it is when the dead shall hear the, the voice of the Son of God and those who hear shall live. Um, 
I, I think there, um, I, I think I would make the, the, the assertion there that those who are dead are those who are dead in their sins, and those who are dead, um, it, it's sort of a Roman 6 thing where, where we are, um, we are buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in the of life. And so I think, I think we are all dead. You know, the wages of sin is death. And as long as we are in sin, we are dead until we hear the voice of Jesus uh, calling us out of that life and then, then we're made alive again. So, um, so I, I don't, I like, the, I like the idea of tying it to that, but I think, it's, I think that's a little different application. Tim, <laughs> lay it on me. I just, I want to plant something in everyone's ear and then come back and talk about it next week. I think Psalm 142 will tell you what he meant by prison, but I, we don't need to get in tonight. Oh, man. We'll be here forever. Well, Psalm we're only going to be here five more minutes. Uh, and then we don't have enough time to start the next section. Psalm 142. Yeah, it's not very long. It's, it's when David was in the cave. Cave, okay. The whole world's coming down on him. Literally. I cry aloud with my voice to the Lord. I make supplication with my voice to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, that it's know my path in the way where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, for there is no one who regards me. There is no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may give thanks to thy name. The righteous will surround me, for thou wilt deal bountifully with me. Now there's, okay, so, all right, you're on to something. That, that's, that stirs the thought. Um, 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 Colossians um, Colossians 2 um, verse 12 is I think is all we need verse 12 Colossians 2 verse 12 having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who did what? who raised him from the dead. Okay, so Jesus dies on the cross and then his soul goes to where the dead go and he waits faithfully waiting for his father to call him out of that place. And he doesn't come out until his father calls him. Um, that, I mean, he can't come out. Well, to complete the story the way the story's been told where Jesus does everything that the Father bids him to do, if Jesus voluntarily submits himself to the death of the cross as he did and his soul departs from him and goes to the place where the dead go, for him to come out of his own volition would undermine and undo everything that he's done up to that point. And so it only, it, it's only truly finished and, he, and I think we talked about that when Jesus says it is finished. It's only truly finished until God calls him, when God calls him out of the out of death. That's when he defeated death. And so, so I, I like the pairing of those things. That you know what David says in Psalm one forty two seven: Bring my soul out of prison. Prison is death, and God called Christ out of out of death. Johnny, I have always imagined that he was walking around with Abraham and David and. Lazarus, all of those people saying, you finally have a way to have forgiveness of your sins. Not all yep. those animal sacrifices right. that you did now, sins forgiven. Your sins really are forgiven now. And and I'm here to tell you that just wait for it. It's going to be a minute, but I'll be back. <laughs> and, and it's going to be okay. Yeah, Don. I'm just going to state that that holding area, that prison, you're talking about Hades, and you've got paradise and you got torment. Par paradise, yeah, Hades is, yeah, Hades is death, and paradise and torment, yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's where he's at. And so par so he goes to paradise for those for those days, that, you know, from the time of his death until his resurrection. 
I think that all fits. Does that all fit? Because we're not forced to. James translates Hades as hell, but it's not hell. It's a whole. Well, it, it's it's okay in King James language for those words to be the same, but but in modern English we make a distinction between those things. So so the in King James language it's it's different than our language. Just like I mean the these and the thous and the the ists and the wusts and things. Um, but but it's okay because that was their language. So. Yeah, for, for us, we make a distinction between Hades and hell, but, but the words that are used in there, they're the same thing. Well, hell is Gehenna, and what's the other Well, Gehenna is, is yeah, and, and so, so yeah, there's, hell is the, the location of the, the eternally damned, yeah. Let's not end on that note. Steve, you got something good to say? <laughs> good job. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Justin. Good. All right. All right. Good notes, man. Um, uh, we kind of almost finished that. We didn't even talk about the last three. We only talked about the first, well, really the first one. <laughs> <laughs> it still was a good time. We made it through seven verses today. All right. <laughs>